Look, the microphone. Does it drink? Hold on. We're going to start in about a minute. John, just confirming you can hear me. Yes. Can you hear me? I can and see your presentation. Perfect. Thank you. OK, it's 2 o'clock. Um, for those of you who are joining us, um, welcome. Um, welcome back. For those of you who have been here before, this is our third session of Tuesdays at 2. Um, provided to you by our dental community resource. For those who are new to our community or new first time attending uh, one of these calls, a warm welcome to you. The purpose of uh, these weekly uh, Tuesdays at 2 is to basically take stock of uh, what has transpired in the past week from a communication standpoint as it relates to patient care and specifically at this time, of course, we're uh, dealing with emergency patient care. I'd like to start off by recognizing uh, the members of our team, as I have in the past. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of this group who work behind the scenes from one week to the next to gather the information, synthesize it for us, and uh, present it in a, in a manner, hopefully, that's of some use to you, uh, as we're all trying to make sense of um, this time that we're, we're all living in. Uh, these are some of the folks who you've been introduced to in the past through our evening uh, lecture series, as well as another group of people who work tirelessly behind the scenes on the phone, gathering information for us. We're in a um, significant amount of uh, debt of gratitude to everybody involved uh, in supporting uh, the cause of the, of the dental community resource. Just so, an item of housekeeping once again, please be sure to mute your microphone. It should be muted automatically, but if not, kindly do so or else we'll have too much noise. If you have any questions during this uh, teleconference, please email them to community at dentalcommunity.ca. You can also use the chat feature uh, on this call. Uh, we're not answering any questions, obviously, in real time due to the uh, number of people who are in attendance, but we'll be sure to uh, answer the questions for you in a timely manner. So I'd like to start off today by recognizing that today, April 7th, is uh, World Health Day. And I'm sure you would agree that we owe a profound debt of gratitude to all our medical professionals. They're still giving their all for us every day at great risk to themselves and their families. And we can't thank them enough for their bravery and their service. I think on the, the thought of uh, thinking of the pandemic as it's impacting the world, uh, it's nice to hear and read in the news today that China has indeed ended its lockdown on Wuhan as the country reports its first day since January without any deaths. So that's uh, something for us to ponder and, and some good news to launch us into today's topic. So when Steve and I were preparing together with the rest of our team for today's uh, uh, meeting, our Tuesday at 2, we were focusing, as we have in the past, on updates on the pandemic as it relates to us here in Ontario in particular. We also wanted to try to incorporate a global perspective on the effects this has had on, uh, on dentistry. And to this end, we had been in touch with colleagues in Asia and a dear colleague uh, in, um, in Tuscany, in Italy, who was going to be part of the call to share what their experiences have been. However, in light of um, what we received this morning at 9 o'clock, the email from the RCDSO, for those of you who haven't checked your email yet, has been uh, communication. We decided to put that focus aside for now. We will revisit that at another date. And we're going to zero in today in the half hour we're together on the importance of protecting our team um, and the issues related to our team, our staff, uh, and uh, as well as their families, and the need, the critical need that we all are hearing about for access to the appropriate personal protective equipment. So this is the email that we received today. And for those of you just uh, listening in and not access to video, I'm just going to read this to you. That the, uh, the college... Uh, has received a large number of calls from patients specifically who believe that they may have a dental emergency but can't find a dentist to see them. Um, all dentists, as we know, have professional, legal, and ethical responsibilities to provide or arrange for dental emergency treatment to our patients. So our college is reminding us that this uh, response that patients are reporting to them is obviously clearly not adequate or indeed appropriate. So clearly, the concerns that we expressed last week in understanding that as the timeline has increased dramatically from the first last two weeks of March 
into at the very least the end of April, the number of dental emergencies are clearly going to increase. The college reminds us that continuity of care requires that patients of record have access to their primary care providers, that's us, for guidance on emergency care, including pharmacological management of pain. And we said that we recognize that this could be done for a short period of time, but understood that uh, pharmacological management of pain may not be sufficient enough as the timeline has expanded. College and can, to say that it tells and John, if I can interrupt for a second, I'm going yes, to tell you that from us, we're getting an awful lot, especially in the last week, an awful lot of calls from desperate patients, I think just scouring the internet for somebody to see them. It's, uh, it's becoming an issue. I, I didn't realize that the college had felt it to the same degree, but I can, from our side, we're feeling lots of people calling, you know, with dental emergencies outside of the realm of what we can treat here, um, desperate to find an office that's open somewhere. So I think this is becoming a bigger issue. And we anticipated this, right? Just understanding the, as you know, patients can be held off for only so long. Um, so this does not come as a surprise. Um, we're also being told that if telephone management is insufficient, clinical assessment may be necessary, provided the dental practice has appropriate safety precautions and PPE in place. And that's the challenge that we all face, right, is um, that we, as we think about these patients who need us, because clearly they do, uh, we want to take care of them safely to protect them, protect ourselves, our families, our staff and their families. And we know that we should be doing this with the appropriate PPE in place. A last reminder is that the Ontario government has appealed to all of us, all Ontarians, to do their part during this crisis. For us, this means continuing to use appropriate clinical judgment and providing continuity of care. This is essential to ensure that our patients receive guidance in dental emergencies so that we do not burden the hospital emergency department. So, so this maybe you can you can paint a little uh, what this picture looks like in reality. Yeah, this is a clear mandate from the college today reminding us of our ethical and, and legal responsibility to not abandon patients. And, and I can certainly, as a clinician, the frustration of being asked to preserve or donate PPE, yet need to somehow see the patients that require that care and managing or trying to figure out a way to do that safely where I don't put anybody in risk. The patients, myself, my family, my staff, their family, um, the, the people that come here, all of that is, is really, I feel, maybe I, I'm over, overstating my own personal feeling, but I feel like we're in quite a dilemma as a clinicians right now, trying to figure out how we navigate our way out of this. So if we, if we focus on this issue of PPE, right, if we think of, I think, the two sort of significant messages that resonate uh, with Steve and I, and, and I'm sure with all of you, is the issue of, of PPE being one, and secondly, is, is safety, is providing care in a safe environment. Let's talk a little bit about PPE, and let's talk a little bit about the requests we've received. We're going to go back a little bit to the, the communication we had last week, where uh, the Royal College reached out to us. Uh, under the direction and mandated order from the Ministry of Health for information. The request was for, for us to provide information at this time on, our, on the availability of personal protective equipment in our offices that are, for the most part, uh, shuttered at this time. So this was an email we received just last Tuesday before we went to air for our call with you. Um, and this kind of started to highlight what we heard as the week went on is the, the Ontario Health sense of urgency to collect data on PPE inventories. They proceeded to generate a survey and had a um, couple of webinars last week, which some of you, I'm sure, most of you hopefully uh, took part in, to find out precisely what this was all about. And we've had quite a few questions about this. Um, and this was once again then repeated. So we got that message on Tuesday again on Saturday with a, another reminder how important it is for us to do our part uh, uh, in, this, in this realm in, in contributing information uh, only at this time of what's available in our offices. This is, uh, I think the, the fact that this was repeated, the, the language that was used here suggests cl clearly a sense of urgency. And if you're following the news, as we all are doing, we can appreciate the critical nature of what's happening in our hospitals as the numbers have started to surge dramatically late last week and, and now into this week. So Carmen Mock, a member of our team, 
put together uh, some of the frequently asked questions with regards to this survey. These are questions that we were asked. And I'm just going to run through them very quickly. We'll, we'll provide these to you on our site. And uh, so what is this uh, provincial PPE survey? Uh, well, the Ministry of Health uh, in the province of Ontario wants to know how much PPE we currently have, had ordered or will be ordering, expected arrival date, and any backup pandemic PPE. Another question was, must we complete this? There was obviously some pushback, some concern by members of our dental community in, in response to this. And the answer is yes, we have to complete this. It's mandated. It's a mandated directive by the Ministry of Health. Another question was, would I get penalized if I don't complete this? And again, please understand, this is our interpretation. But I think it's safe to say that if we don't complete this, the consequences are unclear. We just need to know that this was a directive given to us. Everybody um, will use their judgment accordingly. But I would advise that you do indeed complete this. Um, some people could ask, you know, my question, my clinic is not in the same city where I live. Can I do this after this is over? And obviously, the answer is no, we can't do this after this is over because the information is needed now. The critical nature, the timing is critical now, today, especially since we have no end date for the spread of COVID-19. Is the government going to take my PPE? I think that was a very commonly asked question. And obviously, we don't know, but all we need to do at this point in time is provide them with the information to assist. We're talking here, as we said last week, about mortality of patients, of staff, of, of doctors, nurses, etc. And if there's anything we can do to assist, I think it's, it, it just makes sense on so many levels. I've got a question from some dental associates working in a practice asking if they needed to do this, and the answer is no. Only the uh, owners of the clinics need to complete the survey. There's a question about downloading the spreadsheet, where, uh, where and what are the four tabs? And if you look below the spreadsheet, you can see the four tabs titled Readme, Regular Inventory, Pandemic Inventory, and Expired Inventory. Um, lots of questions about this. And if you participate in the webinar, you, you got a sense of that. And obviously, there's a how-to how guide as a reference. And uh, one question was, why can't I see anything after clicking on the link? What happens if I miss a day? Well, the link appeared to be only active between 8 and 5 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And if you miss a day, then just do it on the next available business day. That's is our advice. What does this pandemic inventory mean? This is the inventory that your clinic has stockpiled in case of a pandemic, if some of you have been uh, thinking that way all along. And what if the brand of the PPE is not, um, that you have is not listed on the survey? Well, they still want to know quantities and just stipulate the brand you have in the common section. Another question was, do we fill in the actual quantities or boxes cases? They want to know actual quantities. For example, if you have four boxes of level one face masks and each box has 50 face masks, then basically you can do the math. They need to know specific. They want to know numbers of, of, of units. What about open boxes? Do you include them? And the answer to that is no. Um, do I have to complete this form daily? Well, yes. If you are still seeing patients and your clinic is open, you'll have to update the spreadsheet, obviously, because you're going to be using up the, um, the PP. For those of you where you've shuttered your practice and are not going in, you, don't, you do not need to. And the question, last question uh, we had, and there were several others, we tried to synthesize this, and I appreciate Carmen's effort for this, is can I just email this spreadsheet? And the answer is no, there's no option to email the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is to be uploaded on the link provided. So we wanted to tackle this issue of the survey. There were lots of questions, lots of concerns. Remember, please, this is a survey for information purposes only, and it's our way of helping our, our medical colleagues. Uh, you don't need uh, much, much sort of push from us because I'm sure you're keenly aware of how critical this is. Moving ahead, uh, last in the, in the course of this past week, we have been looking, as you have, I'm sure, for uh, more guidance uh, when it comes to infection control. Um, in dealing with this pandemic. And uh, we uh, got access to this document, a publication just this past Friday, and this coincided with the Premier of Ontario uh, painted, presenting us with a, a sense of uh, projections, models of how this uh, pandemic is going to pan out in our province. Um, we felt that this was a, a very useful document at the time when we're all desperate to seek information, particularly as any information that has some evidence to support it. I wanted to focus a little bit today on this document. Again, it will be put, placed on our site for you to see, but I'm going to walk you through what prompted um, this being written, researched, and published. And I think it's a useful document, at least Steve and I feel so, and we've adopted some of the things here. Um, 
and, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some detail. So the context of this document, once again, just published on Friday, was that dental professional decision makers at all levels are making decisions and providing advice and guidance in a highly complex, rapidly evolving environment based on imperfect and incomplete information. You really probably couldn't think of a more challenging time to be able to give advice. As we said to you all along, uh, we feel and sympathize with the Royal College and any public health, any, any decision maker, because we're de- they're really dealing with an impossible situation. It's rapidly evolving, clearly imperfect, and information is not complete because things are changing so drastically. We've been advised or mandated to seize all routine and elective care and only provide emergency care. So this was the basis for why this paper was uh, put forth. The aim was to provide evidence because obviously we want to do what we do in the context of at least the best available evidence, as imperfect as it is, to provide evidence to support infection control practices where it exists and highlight where it does not, right? It's looking at the gaps in the knowledge base and also to suggest infection control approaches for consideration by decision makers. So what do we know? We know that the the name of the virus is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the transmission routes are multiple. They include respiratory droplets, direct, either person-to-person or indirect, person-to-surface-to-person contact transmission, and also fecal oral, there's a fecal oral route. The SARS-CoV-2 virus can remain viable and transmit disease for variable lengths of time, but it is currently not known how long the virus remains viable. The evidence on this matter is very limited, but one study has estimated virus viability on different surfaces as follows. In airborne droplets, three to six hours. On soft surfaces such as cardboard, up to 48 hours. On hard surfaces such as stainless steel, so think about dental instruments, up to 80 hours, three to four days on hard surfaces such as plastic up to 96 hours, four to five days. And there are the references to go with that. What is the incubation period of COVID-19 and who is infectious? The incubation period is one to 14 days with the average being approximately five days. And it's believed that people are most infectious during the disease, although they may be also infectious before symptoms appear and for a short period after symptoms have disappeared. Making this so challenging, right? Because we've all, we've talked at some length last week about the fact that a lot of asymptomatic people, patients, uh, who indeed are carriers uh, of the virus itself. I, I think, John, this is worth highlighting a little bit because if you go back there, to the yeah, I, I, once we understood that there's asymptomatic transmission or the potential for it, I, I felt really good as one of the, the many on this call that are treating the emergencies that they have to treat and, and for whatever reason can't seem to get them to stop coming in no matter how hard we try to screen them on the phone and I, I took a lot of, of um, care or, or uh, comfort in the fact that you know as long as these people screen negatively they were you know I wasn't really at much risk but understanding that there is asymptomatic potential for transmission really has has made us all who are still at the at, in clinics treating this quite concerned and really having to look at, and that's why this document is so important, how we can ensure that we're safe, that our patients are safe, that our staff is safe. Uh, and I think this makes all of this uh, very, very critical again, that we understand what we can do to try to make this realistic for us to continue to do this in a safe way. Very true, absolutely. Um, what dental care should dental professionals be providing and what dental care should they not be providing? So strongly recommended that we must or should not provide any in-person care beyond caring for emergencies. We've given specific direction from that for that on, by the RCDSO. Uh, most jurisdictions are advising not to perform any aerosol generating procedures unless absolutely essential. And the definition of dental emergencies, again, this is a document that applies to the country as a whole, the world as a whole, because the reference are, come from international sources like the World Health Organization, research in China and Italy, which have been at the forefront. And dental emergencies are characterized as dental trauma, infection, significant or prolonged bleeding, or acute uncontrolled pain. So when providing inpatient, we know we understand the problem. We understand the burden of the problem, but we have patients who require our, our care, and, and we know that we need to, to take care of them with the appropriate personal protective equipment. And what is that? Well, the use of personal protective equipment includes masks, gloves, gowns, and goggles, or face shields is recommended to protect skin and mucosa from potentially infected blood or secretion. 
as respiratory droplets are the main source of the SARS-CoV-2 transmission, particulates respirator masks such as the well-known uh, N95s or higher, wasn't aware that there's an N99, have been recommended for dental care by some organizations. Specifically, if we look at the RCDSO guidelines from March 23rd, they characterize emergency care in two main categories. Those uh, emergencies can be managed without generating an aerosol. In other words, uh, procedures where we can just um, use, we can use uh, contact droplet precautions using procedure surgical masks, gloves, and eye protection, and contrasted that with uh, emergencies that cannot be managed without generating an aerosol. And for that, they spe- specified on March 23rd the need for fit tested N95 masks, encouraged us obviously to conserve PPE supplies, appreciating the, uh, the deficit we were going to be facing in our hospitals and long-term care facilities. And another reminder for us to avoid referring to the hospital dental department, putting us, you know, giving us a sense of the picture, but putting us in a pretty tight box as far as I'm concerned, as far as what we could actually do. And then as the research started to come out, um, talking about, again, asymptomatic transmission, many clinicians thought that even in non-aerosol situations, just being around the public, they wanted to have uh, fitted and 95 masks. And if I, in all transparency in our clinic, the people that are helping me see these patients, we decided that we were going to use fitted N95 masks um, as we saw all these asymptomatic patients as well, even though we have strictly forbidden aerosol as a method of doing anything in this clinic, we still felt the need to do that because the, the literature again talks about this asymptomatic transmission. So questions with these N95 masks, uh, there are lots of them, right? This is a, a new world for us. Most of us have never have never had one of these masks, don't know what they look like, never used one. And we had questions like, can I reuse my N95 mask? And see, maybe you can touch upon a little bit this distinction between uh, the way the CDC describes the use for the N95 mask. Uh, all of a sudden, I become a somewhat of an expert on an N95 mask. I didn't even... <laughs> didn't know the word fitted mask before three weeks ago. And now I, I kind of, this is where I, I'm um, putting a lot of my energy. So the CDC discriminates between an extended N95 use and an N95 reuse, which is of limited um, application. So if we, John, can you switch? Yeah, there's an article um, put out here that specifically about guidance for extended use and limited reuse of N95 masks and all the information, I'm gonna just summarize it quickly, but we'll put this on our website uh, and you can, and you can, and I strongly suggest you read this for yourself. But N95 extended use is what we're hearing about, you know, how we can, in, in times of limited available availability of PPE, which is certainly now, um, extended use re- refers to the practice of wearing the same N95 respirator for repeated close contact encounters with several patients who all have the same respiratory pathogen. So not what we're talking about in dentistry where we are dealing with healthy or unknown status patients. Um, so this is not what we're talking about, putting on a mask and wearing it over the day as opposed to changing it all the time. What we're looking at, next slide if you could, John, if you could switch it, thanks. What we're thinking about is N95 reuse. And reuse is different than extended use. This refers to the practice of using the same N95 respirator for multiple encounters with patients, but removing it between each encounter or doffing it. Um, There is potential that um, respiratory, respirator surfaces contamination. So we wanna limit that by putting a cover over it perhaps another barrier. And and if we are going to try to use this practice of reuse, there's considerable additional training for proper donning and doffing technique, including physical inspection to make sure the mask you're putting on is still viable because they do have a limited life and no one will tell you specifically how many. Also, it has been advisable in in these circumstances where we're really attempting to try to preserve the PPE that we have, that we might be able to use a cleansable face shield um, and other steps of engineering controls, turn the airflow up in the room to reduce the contamination that's settling on the respirator. 
So there's a bunch of different things that we can do to try to extend the use of the PPE that we had. And I strongly advise you find that article and read it if that's your intention. And we'll post it on our site so it will be accessible. Okay, so that's the issue. Obviously, the most significant issue with PPE has indeed been the, the issues revolving around the N95 mask. Uh, what other infection control procedures are recommended when providing dental care in the context of this pandemic? Again, this is all coming out of this uh, uh, McGill University publication from Friday. So in as much as possible, patients should be encouraged to come alone to the clinic. When the patient arrives to the emergency appointment, we should check their, uh, his or her temperature. Important to maintain social distancing, and to do that, we can um, consider timing of appointments. If you have multiple emergencies, to schedule them accordingly, to keep patients at a distance from each other, and also to space the appointments apart um, to be, allow for adequate disinfection of frequently touched surfaces. These are all the recommendations. Also recommended to use four-handed dentistry, which obviously implies having an assistant, and that brings up, I think, a major concern, particularly as our colleagues in medicine and hospitals are encountering as we're hearing of the numbers of uh, healthcare providers who are uh, ending up with the COVID-19 um, uh, virus testing positive for that. And so there, this is a, a major concern of how best, you know, if, we, if it's best to have an assistant, how can we do that in the safest way so our assistants are indeed safe and when they return to their homes, to their families, we're, we're mitigating that risk. Um, so, also, sorry. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to say, with regard to these kind of recommendations, our team meets every morning, the ones who uh, are still here committed to seeing patients with me, and we put these different uh, adaptations in as they become more popular and more available to us. And we just started with these patient mouth rinses. Uh, when did we get this article? Friday. We started with right. this. Yes. Yeah. We started with this yesterday um, in our first you know, just changing protocols constantly. Just this is, is as the information changes, we try to change the protocols. You know, and, and we're reacting as the information emerges. We, you know, in time, we may look back and see certain things more relevant than others, but this is, you know, in real time for sharing with you what, what we know today. And obviously also in as much as possible using x oral imaging for diagnostic purposes. And Steve, you want to comment on how you're doing that? Yeah, we, we didn't even know that there was, uh, that our Panorex can take half images and trying to do as little intraoral films as possible. And that's something we just looked at again in the last couple of days. Again, recommended to use a rubber dam as much as possible. Um, and you can start to think a little bit about the challenges associated with this, but um, this is what's being advised. It, it makes sense uh, to, as much as possible, manually remove decay and pulp tissue and, and manage chemically and to use uh, resorbable sutures uh, for obvious reasons if, uh, if surgery is warranted. Some of the final sort of recommendations are, uh, are pretty strong, I felt, you know, for us to consider seizing all use of aerosol-generating procedures. And this really just speaks to the risk, right? Uh, and the implications of that statement uh, really ties our hands uh, significantly. To continue to rely on uh, screening patients adequately, um, emergency patients adequately, prior to them coming anywhere near your practices. And finally, um, the, the suggestion or the conclusion that looking ahead here, looking at our current status, that for us to enable maintenance of good infection control, right, that's the safety issue, and other relevant protocols, plus efficient use of PPE, which is a commodity that's uh, in short supply. This paper also is uh, recommending or suggesting we give some thought to considering having designated regional centers. And it makes sense because the, looking at the numbers published yesterday morning, uh, our patient family represents the vast number of the COVID-19 cases that uh, exist uh, in, in, in Canada and in Ontario. So this is who we, who you and I, all of us uh, treat on a daily basis. It takes us back to this conversation we had last week of measuring the benefit and risk. So on the one hand, we have the RCDSO, again, in a hopeless, in a very challenging position, but hearing from patients now who are desperately seeking our care because time is not working in anybody's favor as far as the, the increased number of emergencies that are, in, are presenting themselves. So we, they, there's a need for that. We're being advised to keep them away from the hospitals. 
We have limited PPE supply. Um, and then, and, and obviously, we, we need to take care of them without compromising the outcome, because also we talked about the fact that as things are delayed, as care is delayed, there's implicit biologic um, deficits that are going to occur. And then there's the risk, the risk to us, to our patients, to our staff, um, and what can we do to keep everybody safe? And to our community by using PPE and seeing these patients in a, in a frivolous way. We have to preserve all those things and weigh all of that. Correct. So, again, in conclusion, as we're uh, wrapping up here today, um, the reality is definitely setting in, even in just these seven days, that we're dealing with a long-term separation and the implications of the timeline. Uh, we know that uh, we have to continue to take care of uh, our patients with dent for dental emergencies. This was confirmed again the, this morning from the RCDSO because we must keep them away from showing up at the at hospital. The critical nature of protecting our staff and for them to un make sure that they do understand the implications of them coming to support us as we take care of these emergencies. And we had the conversation of morbidity and mortality for the first time as it relates to care. We've discussed the issue of PPA, the need for information purposes to know what's available, and the fact that hospitals have urgent needs, concerns, particularly with the thought that we weren't going to be receiving any from any uh, N95 3M masks from the United States. It appears that that has been addressed. And then this recommendation to set up a community urgent dental care center. And we want to talk a little bit about that before we say goodbye today, because we've been giving this some thought since we read this document uh, on Friday. And the determinants, um, first of all, of what it would take to create an urgent dental care center. First of all, is there a need for it? Do we believe in our community for the DCR, for, for all of us? Is it something that we should be considering? And if we should consider it, what are the things that we need to look at? And Steve, maybe you can comment a little bit about what would constitute, what would make up the, the backbones to, to uh, an urgent dental care center. So in, in consultation with, with some of the people in our community, some of the concerns are that I'd like to see my patients. I just don't have a, a way of doing that safely. And it was our vision that John and I started to really think about, could we create a safe environment where, pay, where dentists could come and care for their patients? And what would be the reality of that? So the, for a safe location, we would need something large enough for the physical distance requirements. And we immediately thought that the Allied Center and the Chrysalis Center, which are sitting relatively dormant, would be, we would be willing to offer that as a, as a possibility of a location for this. Um, and then we have to look at the engineering controls. Could we modify the airflow to be appropriate for what would keep us safe or what would be recommended to keep us safe? And just giving you an idea that we're in the process of consultation with that, and uh, it's looking like we might be able to create this environment. PPE is a major issue. We've had early uh, consultations, and I don't think that at this time, the Ministry of Health is going to allot PPE from the healthcare system into the private dental settings. We might be able to do that it, with some more negotiation, but right now PPE is the limiting factor. We also would absolutely need expert consultation with regard to the infection control protocols. We would, and, and we, to be, you know, part of our, uh, our community is infection professionals that can really help us and have already taken this on and are uh, giving us guidelines with, with that in mind. Uh, another huge problem of this is recruiting staff that are both willing and able and understand the risks that are associated with, with manning a clinic uh, for urgent dental care. So there's still lots of, of barriers that we have to get through. And if anybody has ideas or, or is, thinks this is something they would like to you know, uh, help us with, if they could just email us or let us know, we'd be, and, and if you think there's a need for it, we'd like to, you know, know that there's a need for it, then we'll continue to try to fight this and, and hopefully be able to come up with something that will work for all of us. We, we feel if we can, we'd like to help, but there's still a, a significant number of barriers in our way. Yeah, and that's, that, that's essentially where we're at, you know, based on today's communication, is this, this very impossible position, which is understandable, of course, but 
not a comfortable one for any of us who uh, who are getting calls from patients who we've been taking care of for so long, who desperately need now as time goes by are going to need to be taken care of. So we'll leave you with that thought. Give us some guidance. Let us know if it's something that's uh, any thoughts that you may have, uh, please feel free to communicate with us uh, via email. Um, we look forward to our next call uh, next week, and I'll once again direct you to our uh, our site where we continue to update um, uh, information um, as it becomes available to us. We've split it up into different categories with all the RCDSO posts, summaries of our Tuesdays at 2, public health posts, information from the ODA, the government, and some issues on, on patient-centered care. This will continue to be a uh, uh, common place for, for you to go to and hopefully of use to you as more information becomes available. I wish you well. Uh, please be well and stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.